Thank you, sir. <laughs> Is it ready? All right. Hey, let's, uh, let's stand to our feet and let's just honor Jesus in the house. Praise God. Father, we just love you. We thank you. Glory to your name, Lamb of God. <laughs> Father, with you, we are and can do absolutely nothing, Father. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. You are wonderful, Jesus. You are wonderful, Jesus. Yes, Lord, we welcome that Holy Spirit, your presence. We worship you. We glorify you, Lamb of God. Jesus, you're wonderful. <laughs> I thank you, Lord, I, and I declare and decree that in the name of Jesus Christ that you inhabit the praises of your people, God. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Father, that the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. And that you have anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, bring deliverance to the captive, recovering of sight to the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised and wounded, God. And I thank you, Father, and I give you praise. This service completely belongs to you, and we honor you and your presence in it. In Jesus' name, all of God's people shout at a great big amen. As is my custom, you can high-five someone and be seated. We'd like to give a special shout out to the House of Freedom that came to support their pastor. Thank you. God bless you. I'm so honored. Yeah, that'll make a pastor happy right there. That just kind of makes your buttons kind of pop. But uh, anyway, I uh, have noticed that when we come to conferences as pastors, a lot of times we're coming and it's like we're looking for a nugget. Boy, and that, there's been a bunch of them throughout this one, isn't there? Or maybe a new program that you could start, something that is working over that church, and, you know, maybe I can apply it here. But I don't really come to ask you pastors and ministers how your church is doing. Because today I kind of want to echo a little bit of what Pastor Bob ministered yesterday. I want to ask how you're doing. How are you doing? How is your prayer life? How's your family? See, this is where the rubber meets the road. I uh, have discovered if you read any statistics, it would seem like pastors are being burned out by the bunches. And, uh, you know, I went online and looked up some statistics of pastors and I don't know, this may have been statistics taken at a conference for burned out pastors. So I, you know, so obviously you're going to get a little lopsided on it maybe. But uh, it, it says that 50% of the pastors feel very inadequate to meet the demands of their jobs. 50%. I know that there was a lot of times that I felt very inadequate for the task at hand and many times still do. But I've discovered that when I allow the breath of God, the pneuma of God to blow wind in my sails, all of a sudden then, that which used to be difficult becomes very easy. I framed houses and was a carpenter, and uh, thank God I don't do that anymore. But uh, I framed houses and was a carpenter, and I would carry a hammer on my pouch, but I didn't like to use it because I had another hammer called an air nailer, pneumatic, pneuma. Breath, the pneuma, the spirit of God is called the pneuma, pneumonia. And I found out that when I took that air nailer, the pneumatic nailer, I could bam, bam, bam. And that which would have taken me a long time and was very difficult to do with a swinging of the arm became very easy when the pneuma, pneumatic tool. And I do my best to keep my winds, my sails up and my heart right with God to keep him blowing wind in my sail. I told someone the other day, they asked, have you ever burned out? I said, well, I've browned out a few times. I can tell you, I've browned out a few times. And any time I brown out or even come close to burning out, I recognize that the difficulty in me is that I'm not allowing God to blow breath. It's 
the, 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 the situation is always my relationship with him. It's not what's going on around me. It's what's going on in me. And if I'm not having the breath of God blow in me, I realize there's great difficulty uh, around me. It says that 90% of the pastors feel that they have failed at some time to meet the expectations that others have placed upon them. I say a big amen to that. <laughs> uh, John Bevere has a book out called uh, The Bait of Satan, and uh, I really recommend it. It's really a good book. But he talks about, have you ever noticed that people get easily offended in church? Is that just me, or does anybody notice how quickly and easily people in church can get offended? Yeah. Uh, he, he gives a very great illustration of why that is. Because, have you, ever heard, have you ever heard this? The world treats me better than the church. He gives an excellent illustration of why that is. Because your expectation on the world is about a three. And so when they give you a four, they've exceeded your expectation. When they walk into church, their expectation is about a six or a seven. And when you only give them a four, all of a sudden, then they're offended. And their expectation on a pastor on a scale of one to ten is about 12. <laughs> and when he only delivers nine or ten, they offended. So you have to recognize the pressures that you're under and realize that we're living in a very offended day. Back in, well, back last year, 2015, there was a stack, probably three or four foot tall, uh, of papers that things that people get offended of nowadays. <laughs> Front and back. <laughs> and stacked it up about that tall. And Jesus said in the last days people would be offended. That's one of the signs. And so you have to realize to keep your heart right. You see, there was a time in my ministry when I found myself getting offended at, at people because my expectations of them. I remember praying in my church, and I could take you right to the spot. It, was in, it would be in that corner of my church that I was praying, and the Holy Spirit said this to me. He said, never allow the unfaithfulness of others to become your unfaithfulness. Because I was about ready to just say, if this is how it is, but I don't see Jesus as he's hanging on the cross saying, well, if this is how it is. It, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 52% of the ministers say that ministry is hazardous to their family. This has been a constant struggle for me, but I'm doing much, much better and uh, very happily married. And uh, I will say this, early in my ministry, I was working full-time. My wife was working a full-time job. We were pastoring. I was trying to preach three sermons a week counsel people, Mary, Barry, you name it, all the stuff that goes along with it, phone calls, texts. And I remember one night I was sitting in my chair studying as I did every, because that's all I had time to do was study for another sermon or talk on the phone or whatever the case may be. And my wife got ready to leave for work. And she's walking out the door and I say, bye, babe. And she looks at me with the most hollow eyes. And I realized that she was completely bankrupt. And I thought, somehow, this isn't how it's supposed to be. And the Holy Spirit said this. He said, if you will take care of your bride, I will take care of my bride. And things begin to shift, and I begin to take care of my bride. And as I begin to take care of my bride, I found that the Lord was doing a pretty good job of taking care of his bride. I've got this thing where I just sort of go back to the original plan a lot. I just, I just open the book and I'm like, how does it work? Seventy percent of the pastors say they have no close friend or someone to confide in. S someone asked me 
you know, so you part of ICFM or, you know, say, you know, who are you with? I'm saying, well, you know, part of ICFM and told them I'm ministering and et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, well, what's that stand for? And I was like, uh, International Convention of Faith Ministries. Then I thought, well, is it International Conference of Faith Ministries? <laughs> yes, Pastor Bob. Thank you, sis. He and, I, and so that's what I told him. I said, really, it stands for I care for ministers. I don't care if I get convention or conference wrong on that. It doesn't matter to me because what it really means to me is I care for ministers. That this is a place where we hold one another up, where we're not beating one another down or trying to outdo one another. This is a place where we love one another and want to hold one another up. I went to a conference some years ago, a leadership conference, and for two days, basically all they did was tell you in sometimes subtle ways and sometimes not so subtle ways that if your church wasn't as big as theirs and you weren't going and blowing, you need to just close your doors and come join us. And I'm so glad I'm not part of something like that. I'm so glad I'm part of a place that if your name is Noah and you've got eight people in your boat, you're faithful to the end to be faithful to God and fulfill the call and destiny of God on your life. And I'm so glad to be hooked up with that man right there. I, I appreciate you, Pastor Bob. I do. Praise God. 26% of the pastors say that they do have quality prayer time. That would be 74%. How can you give what you do not have? If we do not keep ourselves in a right relationship with God, how can we give out? I've had some paradigm shifts, some mind shifts in my years of ministry, but many of them have come just within the last three, four years. I've had some shifts because they had to or I wouldn't have made it. I was in my car one day driving and I was... Uh, Complaining to the, praying to the Lord. <laughs> Y'all know nothing about that, I know. But I was, yeah, to the Lord. I complained and praying to the Lord. Church wasn't growing and, you know, I was frustrated about this one or that one. And I was just, uh. And the Lord was like, all he did was just tell me, Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be fulfilled. Seek ye first. So I began to wonder, how does that work? And so I went back to the church and we began to have prayer meetings, which we've not led up on. Every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock, we have a prayer meeting. I realize, you know, some churches are on 24-7, and I say, yes, that's my heartbeat that we get there. Right now, we have a Tuesday. Ladies come and join Tuesday mornings. They have prayer meetings. We have a Saturday morning prayer meeting. We fast the first Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, of, or, or the first, let's see, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of every month. We have a fast. We break. I love that. We, we break, go to break fast after we have prayer meeting on Friday night. We then go to break fast, <laughs> and that's wonderful. And I have discovered that the Spirit of God does not move in our services because we have great praise and worship, although I'm very thankful that we do have some very good uh, gifted and talented and anointed praise and worship team. I'm very delighted in that. And I guarantee you it does not move because I preach good. It moves because people pray. When the Spirit of God moves in our services, it's because they've been moving, moving in our prayer meetings. And I said this to, our, to, my, uh, to the church the other day. I said, I actually enjoy prayer meetings and look more forward to prayer meetings than I really do even Sunday morning service, and I love Sunday morning service. Because we just go and we chase after God. We hunger and thirst after Him. We call heaven down, and heaven answers. 
And when he comes in the room, everything else gets taken care of. One of my biggest frustrations was going to church and going through the motions. And I said, God, I can't do this. I can't just go through the motions. I, I can't just sing three songs and get up and preach a sermonette to Christianettes so we can hurry up and get to the buffet. I said, I can't do that. I've got to have a move of God. I've got to have the Spirit of God stirring. I need the breath of God to blow in the, in the services. You know, back in 2001 when 9-11 happened, for about two weeks, churches filled up. Then the fear of God, I guess, left everybody. Figured they was okay. But I also have to wonder, when they came to church, did they not find what they were looking for? Were they like, okay, so they can entertain me good. I can be better entertained out in the world. I've discovered something. I, I know on, on, our, on our budget, we will never out Hollywood Hollywood. I will, I will never out Hollywood Hollywood. I'll never out Broadway Broadway. Yes, I want my, you know, platform looking nice. And I would like, you know, I'd love to just spice it up, but... If, it, if it's void of the presence, I could care less. That's right. Come on. Pastor Bob, that was one of the best renditions of Amazing Grace. I think I... That was awesome! Yeah. Monday night, we were... My uh, uh, worship leader and, and lead guitar player, we was over there, and, and uh, their mama, mama back there, and uh, you got up to sing. <laughs> my lead guitar player leans over and says, if you keep practicing, you might. And my, lead, my worship leader says, no, <laughs> ain't happening. <laughs> and I know it doesn't sound very good coming out here, but I want to keep it sounding good in here. When I worship, I just wanted to be sure it comes here. Because heaven hears a different sound than what maybe, you know, I can empty out a church real good by singing. But there are times I can fill up a room by myself. Come on, that's good, that's right. Woo! Yeah. Glory to God. That's right. Yeah. I have had some mind shift change. I had to get off of the comparison wagon. I had to quit looking at TBN to tell me how church was supposed to be. I, I literally did. Because I would see how it w they were doing it. And I'd be so frustrated. Because we couldn't do it that way. And I sure couldn't do it that way. I, I, said, I said to the Lord here a while back, I was like, how come you didn't make me preach more like I mentioned the guy's name, but, you know... And he simply said to me, because when you're dead, you're going to stand before me. You're going to give account of your life to me. And you better preach, Jesus saves, man is a sinner, he needs a savior. There is a day of judgment that every man, woman, boy, and girl is going to stand before God and give account of their life. And I said, oh, okay. Because I realized I was comparing myself to preachers that are really inspirational speakers with a little God twist to them. Sprinkle a little bit of God on there, but never mention Jesus. Jesus is what it's all about. I discovered I need to get back many times to the original blueprint how did Jesus do it how they do it in the book of Acts I was pastoring or excuse me I was uh, doing carpenter work and the boss I worked for he had a, got a brand new labor and he sends him out to cut rafters so he gives him the patterns and goes out there and cut rafters so he goes out there and you know okay 
okay, boss man, the rafters are done. Well, come on, let's get up here and hang them. We go up there, we start hanging the rafters, and all of a sudden, these things are not fitting. What's going on? So my boss says, I gave you a pattern, what'd you do? He said, well, I marked it out and cut that board. He said, then I put another board under that one and cut that one. Then I used... Anytime we get away from the original pattern. The book of Acts is my original pattern. Whoo. When they gathered together, the Holy Ghost fell. When they had prayer meetings, the earth shook. I'm ready for earth-shaking prayer meetings. I'm ready for people to gather in the house of God and the tangible presence and the glory of God fall. In the Old Testament, under the Old Covenant, the blood of bulls and goats, the glory of God fell so strong that the priests could not stand to minister. People got waylaid. Messed up in the spirit. I'm hungry for a move of God like that. Sister Pack, that precious woman of God back there, she, uh, she had went to Brownsville two different times. She said, Pastor, she tells me this Sunday night. She's shaking under the, she, I call it vibrating. She was vibrating, shaking, trembling under the power of God. And she says, I went two times to Brownsville. When I came back, she said, for a year, I would lay in my bed and just vibrate. The presence of God and the glory of God. And Sunday, it was back on her and she was shaking. And she says, Pastor, it's coming. It's coming, it's coming, it's coming. Come on, don't, satis don't be satisfied with status quo Christianity. Don't be satisfied with church as normal. Don't be satisfied until the breath of God blows in your service, blows the chaff away, and causes the anointing and the presence of God to fall, which breaks yokes and hindrances in people's lives. Come on, the fire of God has burned things out of me that I think nothing else could have. You get in the presence of God and things get burned out of you. In uh, Europe, and there are even some here in America called no-go zones. Have you all ever? Anybody heard of no-go zones? No-go zones, no-go zones. How many of you have not heard of a no-go zone? No-go zones are areas where Muslims move into a neighborhood. They take over that neighborhood. That neighborhood then becomes Sharia law. The police do not even go in there. You do not go in there unless you're going to abide by Sharia law. No-go zone. I said to my church, I said, how about we become a yes-go zone? How about we, we can't tap into so much heaven? Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. What if heaven invaded this spot of earth here on this hill, Pastor Bob? We're declaring decreeing at the House of Freedom at 300 Blue Ridge Boulevard, Independence, Missouri, 64053, that that spot of land becomes a yes-go zone that heaven invades. And get this, if it ain't welcome in heaven, it won't be welcome there. What do you mean sickness, disease, iniquities, and bondages fall off of people when they walk into the church? Wow. Mm. I'm hungry for a yes-go zone. I'm hungry that when we walk into church that it's like heaven. I'm hungry that it's like John 17. John 17. Uh, Brother Bob Yandian got there last night. If he would have kept reading a little bit, it talks about, oh, that we might be one with him and he with us. And that we might be one with another. And then the glory of God. 
I, I used to, I'd heard a preacher years ago say, that's the only prayer Jesus ever prayed, never got answered. And I thought to myself, well, what about Acts chapter 2? When they were all in one place in one accord. And the glory of God fell. I said, it's God answered. And hear me. We, we, I don't know about you. And I, well, I do know about you. You're praying for an end time revival. You know, the book of Joel says, in the last days, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. I had somebody tell me one time, they said, well, that was fulfilled back in the book of Acts. I said, well, how much more last days are we now? How much more shall the Spirit be poured out in this day? Yeah. Isaiah chapter 60 says, uh, Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you, for darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people, but the glory of God will rise upon you. Yeah. Friend, we're living in a dark day, in a dark hour. That just means we're ripe for the glory of God. My uh, in-laws, they are Mexican, or they've since left this planet and went, went on, but they're Mexican. They were Mexican. and Although they lived in Kansas City, just a, actually a few blocks from where our church is now, they lived in Kansas City, yet when you would pull up in the driveway, you'd be met by a concrete statue we called Pedro. And when you walked into the house... You would hear, I always get this wrong, that, curi cu that music. Help, help a preacher out. Curiati, yeah. Yeah, Cuc huh? Cucarati? Yeah, you, you would hear that music. You know, that, you'd, hear, you'd, hear, you'd hear that music. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. They would, they would be playing that music. And the food wasn't fried chicken, mashed potatoes, and gravy. It's flatas and burritos and some tacos and stuff that I had no idea, but it was sure good. Some stuff they didn't tell me what it was till afterwards, and it was a good thing. <laughs> but I ended up saying, I don't care. That's good stuff. I'll eat pig gut any day if it tastes like that. That's all right. <laughs> but when you would walk into their house, it was like walking in to Mexico, even though they were in America. The Holy Spirit, why? Because they came from Mexico. The Holy Spirit come from heaven. What's he want to bring with him? When he comes into the services, it should be like heaven. glory to God. When he comes on the inside of your life, he's wanting to make the inside of your life and my life like heaven. glory to God. That'll make a Baptist shout. That'll make a United Methodist shout. I was raising my United Methodist. I guess I'm still in. They never told me they took me off the roll. I don't know. I'm sure they wouldn't claim me anymore. But, uh, years ago, I'd read a book on church growth. And it basically got me away from the original pattern. Never, never, never mention eternity. Make it all about their life now. Mario Murillo made an astounding statement one time when he said, uh, if you're living your best life now, then you're going to hell. And uh, so I, I had to do some getting back to the original pattern. I have learning to absolutely love what I do. Yeah. I, I, 
can't see me doing anything else. Someone asked me the other day, said, you ever think about quitting? I said, I don't have a plan B. I just don't. There's no plan B in me. I, I don't know. You know, there may come that transition time, but I can always see me preaching, ministering. <laughs> Paul the Apostle in Philippians 4, I guess I better have you get some word, hadn't I? Or you guys would be like, man, he, he preached but never opened the Bible. I, I don't hardly open my Bible anymore because I got it all right here. You, you know what I mean? This new modern stuff. But Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Paul the apostle says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God, and the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep and guard your heart and mind through Christ Jesus. Paul is not in a nice cushy office, air conditioning blowing on him, eating bonbons and grapes and a cup of coffee, studying. He's in a prison cell with a bloody back, is lucky to have bread and water, and yet in that situation, he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he says, in case you didn't get it, let me say it again. And again, I'm going to tell you, rejoice. I've had to learn that joy is not predicated on what's going on around me. It's only predicated by what's going on within me. And when I get the joy of the Lord bubbling on the inside of me, the Bible calls, you know, part of the fruit of the Spirit, the love, the joy, the peace, long-suffering, temperance, you know, faith, these things, these, that's a fruit, and you develop it. You want to know when we preachers get into trouble? When, preacher? We preachers get into trouble, if we're not careful, when our fruit gets bigger than our root. How many ministers have imploded because their fruit got so big, yet their root became so little? Today, I don't want to talk to you about your fruit. I want to talk to you about your root. Because if we get the root right, the fruit will be right. And Paul says, in the midst of everything going wrong, rejoice in the Lord always. Another pastor in the Bible I guess really he's a prophet, but when you're a pastor, everybody's a pastor when you read the Bible, you know. Habakkuk. I, I know I probably didn't say that right. One old preacher called him Tabaka. Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17. says, although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. And there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like hinds feet. And make me to walk upon my high place. That sounds to me like Pastor Habakkuk is having him a bad day. The fig tree's not blossoming. Ministry ain't working right. There's no fruit on the vine. Nobody getting saved. The labor of the olive is failing. Where's the anointing, God? The field's yielding no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold. He's spending his time chasing people that's getting out of the fold, burning himself out. But something happens between verse 17 and 18. He gets a paradigm shift. He gets a shift in his mind. And he's saying the fruit may not be good. I better go back and check my root. And he goes back and checks the root. And said, hey, there ain't joy happening in here. There ain't some peace happening here. So then he begins to say, yet will I. Someone say, I will. I will, I will means it's a choice. Oh, when the Lord just throws it on me, 
then I'll have joy. You got to make up your mind. This is the day the Lord has made. I will. I choose. It's my will. I exercise my will to joy in my God. And when he began to do that, look what happens. The Lord becomes his strength. Why? Because the joy of. He makes my feet like hinds feet. That's that deer that goes up the mountainside. Sure-footed. Joy will keep you sure-footed. My foot had not slipped. But when I put my joy in the Lord, it became a stable, strong tower within me. He will make me to walk upon my high place. God's got a high place for us. Come on, God's got a high place for us. And the key to entering into it is the joy of the Lord in the midst of situations and circumstances that may be contrary to everything you want. I'm just going to choose the joy in the Lord. Mm. Yeah. Seems like in America, y'all doing all right? Got about five minutes or so still? Okay. Is that all right? Okay. Okay. America used to be the greatest producer nation. They are now the greatest consumer nation. That mentality runs rampant in our church now. I used to think that church was like a restaurant. And if I could fix up a meal nice and hot, that people would come back next week to eat again. (laughs) Great, right? No. Begin to realize that people were coming to church for what they could get. Uh, No, I'm not going to receive an offering, so that's not where we're going with this. But people come to church when it's all about me. You know, when we have praise and worship, some people are like, well, I don't like that song. (laughs) Brother Gary, some time ago, he was uh, at at another church, and this this is years ago. He'd been working. He he worked for TWA, wasn't it? Yeah, worked for TWA, and it had been working him over time. He hadn't been to church in a while. And finally, he gets a day off. He's like, I can't wait to go to church. It was a Sunday night, and he's like, I can't wait to go to church. He says, I'm sitting there, and I'm shaving. And, and he's like, God, I need, you, I need you to touch me bad. and uh, I just need you real bad, God, and, and you, you better touch me tonight. And they, I hope they, Lord, Lord, let them sing that, my favorite song, because I always feel you when they sing that song, and let them sing that one, and, and oh, and let them sing that one too. And, and the Lord said to him while he's there shaving, well, that's all fine, but what are you going to give me? Brother Gary said, I went to church that night, They did not sing one song that I even liked. He said, but I praised. He said, but I praised. And I worshiped God like it was, like he was so close. He said, since that day, my whole worship has changed. And I can tell you something. Whenever, you know, almost any time that I look over at Brother Gary during praise and worship, Going after God. Going after God. I would love for our, you know, the very term worship means worth ship. In other words, it's he is worthy and I am acknowledging his worthiness. And because he is worthy, I'm acknowledging his worthiness, I worship him regardless of what's going on around me. Regardless of if they play my favorite song or not. 
regardless of if I look, in, look around and everybody else. I need a stronger cup of coffee this morning. Regardless. Woman enters in to the room where Jesus is at. She has a very costly perfume in an alabaster box and about a year's wages and we're not really told how she got that except that it was probably by ill repute and she comes in to worship and it's interesting because she breaks the alabaster box and once it's broken it can't go back Sometimes I'll sign off of an email or a text message with loving Jesus, loving life, and living poured out. Loving Jesus, loving life, and living poured out. Living a poured out life. Well, I'm pouring it out because when you pour it out, you can never pour out more than God can fill you up more. And she poured it out. And the aroma of her worship filled the room. What if, what if we worship so much that the aroma of our worship filled the room? Last year we were having a, 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 one of our break fast prayer meetings on Friday evening. And it was the most awesome thing. Because we got worshiping and praising and chasing after God. And several different people was like, do you smell that? Do you smell that? It was a fruity, uh, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, it was a fruity, flowery smell. It, it was just like, and I would walk into the cloud of it. And I would stand there. And then it would move. And I would chase it. You're like, that pastor's crazy. But I... They call me nuts, but I'm screwed on the right bolt, so that's okay. <laughs> it was so refreshing. What had happened? Our worship had become a sweet-smelling fragrance in the nostrils of God. And I believe as it was smelling to him, he was letting us. He may have sent an angel down that had been lingering around in the garden up there and just came down with the smell of him all over him because it would be like over there and over there. Mama kept saying, there. As a matter of fact, I was walking by. She goes, it's chasing you, Pastor. It's chasing you. I smell it behind you. <laughs> You're like, that pastor, he's not. I know. I know. I just want him. I just want him. When we come to the house of God, what if we really, really came with a heart to worship? Heart to love him. What if it, now for me, I, I, I say this, because what if it wasn't about how good I could sing? Because it's not. But how good he heard it. What if we worship like that? I just, I just love for us to stand to our feet. Pastor Mama, I'd love for you to sing something because you, you got it, man. You can just. <laughs> you, you can acapella better than the best of them. Give it, up, give it up for Pastor Bob, and let's get our hearts. Just for a few moments, let's worship. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's just raise our hand and praise him. And I'm not really going to sing a song. Let's just, let's just sing out in tongues. What do you think about that? Oh, <laughs> Murder Shonda Ramata Sonda Ramatu Shikite Didi la Mosonda O Sara Moshon de Rimakite Roma Mamoko Tushon de Rimasikite 
और मसाठा शेके ढे मुसंदर माटी द हीरा मसूंठ और मकुटे और मसाठा रे माके ओ हालेलुया ओ वी ब्लेस यू लॉर्ड जेसस ओ वी लव यू लॉर्ड गॉड हालेलुया Oh hallelujah. Oh we bless your name oh God. We thank you for your presence oh God. Oh hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless your name. Oh rahmat sundari makiti. Oh rahmat sundari makiti. Fiete de mosoto romoko. It used to be that little chorus that we'd sing. We go, "There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I can search for all eternity long and find there is none like." You can sing that again. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is none. Like you.